Our speaker this afternoon is Lee Bissett. Lee Scaler Bissett is a faculty instructional consultant at the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching at the University of Kentucky. With over 15 years of classroom experience, Dr. Bissett has transitioned into a faculty development role, specializing in digital pedagogy and digital humanities. She has published in outlets such as Hybrid Pedagogy, the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy, and Educating Modern Learners. She has also taught the, Di the Digital Pedagogy and Network Learning Workshop at Humanities Intensive Learning and Technology Hilt. <laughs> Her blog, College Ready Writing, is at insidehighered.com. And I'm just gonna give a little shout out. She has one of the best Twitter accounts on the web. <laughs> Thank <And> you. <laughs> without further ado, please take it away, Lee. Thanks so much. And, uh, um, and I apologize for not being able to be there uh, in person, um, but this is uh, one of the drawbacks that I'll get into about uh, sometimes doing digital pedagogy in uh, different uh, structures. So this talk is going to be a little bit different um, because what I'm looking at is more of a um, 10,000 foot view and really asking the question of how do we support digital pedagogy um, at the institution, uh, at an institutional level and not just at a classroom level. How do we really make those cultural changes to embrace the digital pedagogy? And I would argue that one way we could do it is through teaching centers, but it's not necessarily that simple. Um, if you want to follow along with my presentation or view it later, um, the address, I don't know how well you can see it, is up there, but it's bit.ly slash digped2015. So basically the hashtag for the conference um, is going to be there. Uh, I thought I'd be cheeky and put a background that's Second Life up there just because uh, when we talk about digital pedagogy and innovation, we, we have to remember sometimes uh, these things change rapidly, which is the other uh, challenge that we face because uh, institutionally we're not necessarily prepared to change uh, as rapidly as the technology does, but I'll talk about that a little bit uh, as I go on. So you already introduced me, but um, for my Twitter handle I am ready writing on Twitter and uh, I do have uh, a Twitter, uh, my tweet deck open. So if you have any questions or anything, uh, feel free to at me on Twitter and I'm following along with it uh, as we go. So if I get distracted, that's the problem. <laughs> but I would actually like to start with the question, not about digital pedagogy, but ask the question about what do you think of when I say faculty development? And those of you who are on Twitter, if you wouldn't mind tweeting it, um, I'm pretty sure I can hear people, or I don't know if they muted the microphone, um, but certainly you could also shout it out. That's all right, too. Uh, in that way, I wasn't sure what the interface was going to be. But really, um, what, what do you think of? It's a room of people who are very interested in, in digital pedagogy, practicing digital pedagogy. But when I say faculty development, what do you think of? Anyone? Watching the Twitter? I'll sing the Jeopardy song. <laughs> I'm just watching the room to see if there's any questions. Training. training. Oh, something about training? Yeah, training. I have uh, from Paige. Hi, Paige. Uh, all day staff retreats. Anyone else? Training. They need to warm up a bit. Yeah, I think they need to warm up a bit. I need to see jumping jacks or something. Needs assessment. Um, needs, oh, we have um, needs assessment. Needs assessment, okay. So, very. Anything else? I want, to, I, don't, I want to give people a chance and really, and, and okay, I'm not going to be offended, right? I'm in faculty development, but I, you will not offend me um, by any of this. <laughs> Does anybody, let me put it a different way. Does anybody, when I say faculty development, go, yay, faculty <laughs> development. <laughs> Hooray. Yeah. Uh, no, it's really, uh, and somebody's saying on um, Becker Walkwell on Twitter says, I think more work. And a lot of the times, um, not necessarily uh, for faculty development, a lot of people think, uh, faculty will think busy work, um, they'll think not necessarily um, uh, productive work. And um, what really inspired me to ask this question, and something that I've been, that I've been um, you know, shaping in my mind 
particularly is this disconnect, a disconnect that we have, um, particularly in the digital pedagogy realm, um, between what we think of as digital pedagogy and good digital pedagogy professional development practice and what we think of when it comes to faculty development on campus. Um, and maybe what faculty development is on your campus. And part of this came from a tweet from uh, Sarah goldrick Robb, where she was at the Digital Pedagogy Institute that was held at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, last week, two weeks ago? Um, last week. And she, you know, she tweeted out saying that this is the first professional development I've ever had for my teaching after 11 years at U-Madison and I had to pay for it. Now, this does not mean, and I know because they advertise a position this year, there is a faculty development center and um, a teaching and learning center on UW-Madison, but then it becomes what is this disconnect between one of their faculty and the center having to go outside of the center to receive their, um, their faculty development that they're looking for and that they want. And one of the things that I, that I think of and that I posit as a hypothesis but the digital pedagogy has largely evolved outside of the traditional teaching and learning center, and one might even say outside of, or alongside, or at the margins of um, the institution of academia itself. Well, let that sit for a second. So digital, let's think about how, and then think for yourself how you came to digital pedagogy and how you came to be practicing digital pedagogy. Was it through institutional means? Or was it through personal, private means, through network, word of mouth, uh, et cetera, et cetera? You know, how did how did you learn it? How did you train in it? Where did you find out? And I bet I, I do a show of hands, but the camera's frozen. Um, I bet that uh, many of you it would not be through formal, but rather informal means. So. Most people, and again, I didn't know this until I got into faculty development, and that's fine, but what I want to do is give a brief history of faculty development, at least has, as the discipline um, or profession sees itself as faculty development, because it's not a very old um, uh, and long-standing um, long practice within higher education. Uh, and so, according to Creating a, the Future of Faculty Development, um, which is a, a seminal text uh, for us, uh, there were five ages of faculty development. The age of the scholar, the age of the teacher, the age of the developer, the age of the learner, and now we are currently, they argue, in the age of the network. And really, uh, what we're talking about here is, uh, initially it was about the professionalization of higher education in the age of the scholar, so not just about teaching, but about um, as tenure got more and more commodified, um, professionalized, really looking at those. The age of the teacher, when it became uh, clear that we um, needed more, uh, more focus on helping faculty become better teachers. Uh, the age of the developer, again, then it, the focus became more inward. How can we become better developers to help faculty become better scholars and teachers? The age of the learner, where we're, we turn more student-centric where we became a large part of student success initiatives. And then the age of the network, which um, uh, is still a negotiated and contested space. Because when uh, faculty developers talk about networks, they don't talk about the same thing that we talk about uh, in digital pedagogy when it comes to networks. Um, they're looking for ways to uh, network within the institution, whereas uh, in digital pedagogy, we tend to think of networks to be a little bit larger. and, and that's, one of the, the points of friction is how do we understand our networks? What do we understand our networks of influence to be? And what do we understand our um, learning networks to be? And that, that is really still a contested space within the discipline of faculty development. Um, but what it represents though as well is that a, ch a challenge to faculty developers is that it is a fine balance. Um, and it's a balance that we are constantly negotiating within faculty development because we evolved inside the administrative structure of the academy. We are in and of the academy and usually on the academic side. Usually we are under the provost office, so we are deeply, deeply entrenched in the academic administrative structure. We also have to answer to both faculty in terms of their wants, needs, and demands, um, and the administration in terms of their expectations. Um, and priorities. If uh, we don't stay on their priorities, we lose our budget. 
Uh, we lose our budgets, we don't exist. This is, this is problematic. It's the, it's the nature of not being an academic unit or department. Centers are much easier to cut than academic departments. That hasn't stopped administrators recently from trying, but nonetheless, it's a bit more of a precarious position and thus must be much more political. There are embedded expectations uh, when it comes to faculty development, what people expect or think they expect or want from faculty development can sometimes be very, very different. And it's the same thing as our students' expectations of what they think the classroom experience should be. It's the same thing with faculty and what they think faculty development experience should be. And there's also an issue of the divisions of responsibility. Um, who is, and we're gonna get, I'm gonna really come back to this question, is who is responsible for um, particularly digital teaching and learning on campus? Uh, and I want you to, uh, again, sit with that question a little bit because we're going to come back to it. And I really want you to, to have that is, is who is responsible for that? Who is responsible for the digital end of teaching and learning on your institution? Or at your institution, not on hand. You can tell I don't have this written and I'm not reading it. <laughs> so what is this academic presentation without pictures of cats? So I'm putting forward this. Uh, instead of a history of digital pedagogy, uh, which we really don't have time for, is that I think the digital pedagogy within the institution, not necessarily as a discipline or an approach, is a three-headed creature, all right? And we have our three cats there. <laughs> Black cats, nonetheless, no less as well. And so I defined it up very simplistically, but I think a way to give us uh, a conceptual framework to really think through this, uh, this challenge is the first the first head of the beast is, are the tools, the tools approach. And these on our campuses, we could think of it being the e-learning office, um, the online learning office, uh, academic perhaps, you have a place called academic technology and support, um, and even larger IT, uh, IT divisions within the institution. So institutionally, with, um, we have these different offices or services or units or even uh, completely separate from academic affairs often uh, in IT uh, divisions. And then external to that, uh, but, but still important too and deeply embedded with, is um, the ed tech industry more broadly. And we can think about um, how uh, our LMS systems, the proprietary technology, electric capture, um, turn it in, all of these types of large scale um, technologies and tools that uh, IT or academic technology purchases or the university purchases for campus wide use. Um, and not necessarily uh, because they're pedagogically valuable, but certainly that there are those negotiations. So you have, and, and, but really the focus is again on the tools. What tools are we using? How can we support these tools in terms of the underlying infrastructure, server space, et cetera, et cetera, IT tech, uh, programmers, um, that's a really big concern uh, uh, from the tool side of things. And often the side we don't think of as academic. Uh, I presented this, um, uh, the, the question of infrastructure to graduate students um, in an educational technology class I was doing, and they never thought of the infrastructure required beyond the classroom. They had lots to say about the classroom that is important, but um, beyond that and larger than that, at a department, at, at a collegial, at an institutional, and even a state level if it's a public institution, um, they weren't thinking around those, those kinds of infrastructures and how those kinds of decisions directly impact our practice in the classroom without them even knowing it. So this is an important uh, aspect of these tools. Who's pushing the tools, what tools, and who's deciding on the tools? Then what I have, I like alliteration, so I'm talking a, a technique. Right? And for this, I really, I could have also called them the, the, the practitioners, the people who are on the ground in the classroom. And particularly for digital pedagogy, we're talking about the digital, hum, uh, the humanists or those who are practicing digital humanities um, and other teachers practicing digital pedagogy. So really the people on the ground. Um, a lot of the people who you will be hearing um, at this conference are uh, talking about the technique, right? Putting the tools into use, the technique, so, so to speak. And then I would add a third category, and not that these categories are mutually exclusive. There is overlap, there's a Venn diagram, but I would say the philosophy or the philosophers. And I would say that those are the connected, net, connected and networked learning pioneers. So I'm talking about the, the Harold Reinbold, uh, the Stephen Downey's, um, the Dave Cormier's, um, who are working with, 
in institutions, um, but have authored a lot of the thinking behind our current practices of digital pedagogy um, in, in regards to network and connected learning. Um, so again, not that they're not also practitioners and not that we aren't the, those who are the technicians aren't also thinking about philosophy and that people choosing the tools aren't thinking about pedagogy, but these could be the broad divisions that we can think about. And it's this really interesting three-headed um, uh, three sort of hydra, uh, so to speak, or cat, you know, LOL cat right there. Um, that we think of when we're talking, when we can think of or, or or break apart the different branches of digital pedagogy or things we need to think about when we talk about digital pedagogy. But what's something else that, that all of these share is that they are, in a lot of cases, renegades. Maybe not IT on campus, um, but certainly they they act often outside of the. Um, the, the academic side. They aren't often under the provost. They are under a different unit on campus. And then you could, you know, the ed tech industry um, uh, relies on uh, the mystique that they are all renegades or innovators or disruptors. Um, but certainly, uh, I'm, and I speak from experience, I speak from speaking to others, um, and from knowledge from my network, those people who, who practice digital pedagogy often do feel like renegades within their own departments, within their own institutions. Um, and same thing with those who are the pioneers in terms of the philosophies um, underpinning and informing it. Um, these were renegades. These were things that were that are evolving and continuing to evolve, but often outside of or at the margins of um, the structures uh, of uh, uh, traditional academia, which is a very, very different place from where centers for teaching and learning and faculty development have been evolving and deeply embedded. So you have these two, if you could see my hands, I'm talking with them, um, <laughs> these two often conflicting um, spaces. You know, you have the space for the renegades and then you have the space for the entrenched. And so how do you make those two things play nice with one another? When, you know, that it's not exactly a, a perfect or a wonderful fit in that way. And some of the ways, and it's not that there hasn't been faculty development, professional development through digital pedagogy, and some great examples are things like that camp, uh, the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, DHSI or HILT, which I taught at, um, the Digital Pedagogy Lab, I was referring to before, um, Wisconsin that just started up, and also even the larger virtual network of um, uh, HACEAC. Uh, but again, these are, HACEAC's a bit of an exception, but most of these, again, are uh, taking place outside of the traditional academic structures. And again, um, teaching and learning centers, I think, have something to learn from that, but it's very difficult to just simply straightforward adapt them um, because they are so outside and the centers are so entrenched. So I'm coming back to the question is, who is responsible, and here's the warm and fuzzy one, who is responsible for supporting and nurturing digital pedagogy, right? Who, right? Is this something that is strictly up to individuals? Um, or are there systems in place that help support and nurture the growth of digital pedagogy, not just in individual classrooms, but in entire departments, entire colleges, and entire institutions? The less warm and fuzzy way, but unfortunately, I think more important way of thinking about it in contrast is the question of what is the infrastructure for growing digital pedagogy? Because that's the other important part. We can't be uh, innovative digital pedagogues if we do not have access to the digital um, in terms of, of support from IT, in terms of training, um, in terms of all of those things that we need. Uh, I'll use the example of, you know, not all institutions have the same access to resources. So we talk about community colleges uh, from an American context, uh, various levels of funding, community colleges, regional state institutions. Uh, one of the um, challenges that I had uh, at my former institution was that um, there was terrible Wi-Fi, and I think that's a complaint everywhere, but, um, you know, I was dealing, um, I taught students who were from some of the poorest zip codes in all of the United States. Uh, you know, some places you can take for granted that all your students have um, uh, laptops and uh, smartphones, whereas we had students who go home for the weekend and couldn't even access the, uh, their Blackboard accounts because they had dial-up. 
right? They didn't have actually even have access to high speed. And then even within the classroom, what kind of uh, Wi-Fi is there? Do your students have any connectivity? Or what kind of technology do, do you as an instructor have access to? I had an old computer that was about to stop working because Windows was stopping to support, you know, Windows 2000 that was still on the computer. So this is, these are, these are important questions. Like you can, um, there's, there's nurturing, but then there's also the infrastructure support. And, and those things are, are again, a balance um, and are both necessary if you want to support digital pedagogy at the institutional level. There are some successful models that do work and, and manage to, to get everybody talking to one another. Um, we have uh, digital liberal arts as a movement. Um, Knightley was a huge, N-I-T-L-E was a huge um, catalyst for encouraging and helping uh, liberal arts colleges with limited budgets, limited resources for things like faculty development to learn digital tools and techniques and to create a network of support for them. And now we see it um, growing up. If you Google digital liberal arts, it's all over the country now. Um, they're not even, like I said, they're not even calling it digital humanities anymore. And they're calling it digital liberal arts. And so that's a really successful model. And part of that is because um, they are small. And it's small enough that you have to work together. Um, there isn't a lot of funding for four different centers, one for academic technology and one for teaching, and then one for um, for the learning management system, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very, very integrated because it has to be. Um, and teaching is, again, the priority of the institution, which makes a difference as well. There are also increasingly teaching and technology centers. Um, this isn't always the case. I can use an example of our own institution where um, we are the center for the enhancement of learning and teaching, but there's an entirely separate unit under a separate branch of the administration um, for e-learning initiatives, so for online um, and hybrid learning. Um, and so, you know, two separate systems, two separate uh, chains of command, um, and honestly, two separate priorities, but if you can set the priorities. So if you can integrate those two things in teaching and technology centers, and there's some really great examples um, in Virginia, uh, I think in particularly of, of Virginia Commonwealth University is a really, really great example of um, a center that, um, that integrates the two really, really well. And I think of the questions of technology and pedagogy, and the two aren't separated by um, administrative barriers. And another one is also digital humanities and libraries. Um, again, libraries can be a place where um, we can talk about uh, pedagogy. Florida State currently trying to um, build uh, digital pedagogy within the, their library system. So there are some examples there, but it's a, but it's a question of bringing people together um, and not separating them. Uh, that that represents uh, models that are most effective. Now, again, um, that's not always possible, but it's aspirational. Again, what are those obstacles? I mentioned them a little bit. Is we have competing priorities. What is the priority of your e-learning division? Um, is it to just put as many classes online? Is it to do so as efficiently as possible? Um, is it to provide technologies that they can get at the best price? Um, is it, you know, what, what, are the, what are the priorities? What are the priorities of the, the provost? What are the priorities of individual colleges? What's priority of your teaching and learning center as it is currently written? Um, these things, uh, they often will come into conflict and lead to barriers for larger institutional change or con even conversations around digital pedagogy. Um, that goes into, again, administrative structures. Who reports to whom? Who has say about what? Um, I told my, again, I told my grad students last year that the most important committees that they could possibly be, potentially be on as they move through their careers are those committees that evaluate educational technologies for the classroom um, because they so directly impact the day-to-day -day practices, and we just take them for granted. They all sort of laughed at me and looked at me funny, but <laughs> it, it, these are important questions. As I mentioned earlier, lack of physical infrastructure that your institution may or may not have and be able to invest in. Uh, entrenched institutional culture, what are the expectations of your faculty? Um, 
we have, uh, again, a culture where we're expected to give um, short, brief, one-off workshops um, uh, that follow a certain format, uh, whereas longer-term changes, uh, those are harder to come by and harder to convince faculty to attend. And also there is the accusation sometimes that this is coming from digital humanities, that it is too uh, humanities focused. Um, it's been a long and an accusation, or not an accusation, but a challenge um, that uh, particularly in our one institution, we have a medical school, we have nursing schools, we have um, engineering and all of that, where they're like, well, what is digital pedagogy? Because it sounds an awful lot like digital humanities. What does that have to do with us? Um, and so again, changing that, institutional culture, but also internally, how do we talk about digital pedagogy? How do we do outreach um, to STEM disciplines, to disciplines that weren't as fast or as quick or as willing to embrace um, digital pedagogy? Right? This represents a, a really, I think, important challenge if we are going to get institutional change is that we cannot just speak to a small hand of disciplines. We must speak, be able to speak to the entire institution. Um, and, it, and it's a problem we're still trying to work out, I think. And if people have good examples of how they've done it in STEM, I would love to hear them in the questions and the comments. And so then you might say, what next? And I would say that one of the most important things is that you need to, you need to work with your center. You need, to, you need to start small, right? Start offering introductory workshops. You need to meet faculty and administrators uh, where they are. You need to do the advocacy and promotion, um, as well as um, involving students. Uh, and I think that this is an underutilized piece of uh, promoting digital pedagogy. And I've seen lots of students uh, on the program presenting, and that's great. Um, but it's getting panels together. It's getting student voices heard. It's getting student work to be featured and saying, look at the great stuff that these students are doing. Um, and they want it. Um, they want to be learning in this way. Now, not all of them do. We can argue about the, 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 the born digitals and all of that. But one, you know, we really do need to, I think, involve students in a very strategic way uh, to make those cases. As we become more and more customer service oriented, we might not like the terminology, but it's something we can use to our advantage, certainly, when it comes to having broader conversations around digital uh, pedagogy. Um, because the students, um, there is a, a critical mass of students who want it and who enjoy it and who want to see what it is and understand it. Some of the work that I've been doing here at the Center for the Enhancement of Learning and Teaching um, is that we have managed to uh, have a collaboration with e-learning and we have what's called the I and D Lab, the Innovation and Design, and it's three-day workshops with uh, faculty who have received faculty development grants, so we do pay them, and that's a problem. Not everyone can pay, but unfortunately, the carrot and the stick. Um, and so it's a, it's a three-day workshop where um, really we have in-depth, not just workshops on tools, but conversations around tools, why tools, more, again, the more philosophical conversations as well as more practical about the tools and the techniques that go along with it. So those opportunities to, to, to get in there. Um, we do a lot of introductory workshops. Uh, I do, uh, you know, as simplistic as it may sound, I do an intro to Google Docs workshop. And um, every time we offer the workshop, you get people who have never logged into um, Google before. And then each, you know, the first thing we have to do is activate the Google account. And we have to show them, you know, this is a Google Doc. And then, you know, really start them at that level, meeting them where they are. Um, because once they get it, they really get it. But uh, you, they, it's intimidating to them. They're scared of it. Um, it's something that they don't know. It's something very foreign. And they're not likely to necessarily jump at it. Uh, so, you know, meeting them where they are, creating these environments where they feel safe, they feel supported, and then as they, as they get comfortable with it, they have a moment where they just get it, and then they really start using it and they embrace it. Um, so it helps that we're a Google Apps school for education, um, so we can tell them this is something that's supported by the university, and it's FERPA, which is our privacy here, uh, compliance in a lot of ways because it's uh, because we use it and a lot of people are worried about that too. So another thing that we that I've been doing is departmental workshops. I did, call it my traveling roadshow. 
um, and I pick out uh, digital tools according to discipline needs um, or, or best practices uh, across disciplines. So I've done it for, again, mostly humanities, but we've worked as well with law professors, um, you know, how to use digital tools in a law classroom. Uh, I'm still working on the STEM one, but, uh, but again, this, uh, being able to reach more faculty, but also make it more targeted and more personalized for their department's needs and approaches and techniques, and just introducing them as well to the network that is available out there to support them. One-on-one -on -one consultation, while perhaps inefficient, are also a really powerful way to change hearts and minds. Um, and then uh, with all of these, there are success stories, monitoring the success stories, and sharing those, highlighting those successes on websites and any other events um, that you can organize on campus to get people really interested and exciting. And one thing that I'm going to put there and I'm going to add is also we are advocates for those faculty who are on uh, the leading edge of digital pedagogy who may be experiencing resistance in their own department. Um, we act as sort of a quote unquote neutral external um, party to be able to come in and say, and show the research and say, no, 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 just because they're not lecturing doesn't mean they're not teaching. Um, in fact, they are uh, engaging in best practices and here's the research to show it and we've evaluated their work or their syllabi or their assignments and this is quality work and so we can put that in tenure portfolios. Um, as responses, because that's one of the other big uh, conversations that has to take place is, um, you know, what is the institutional culture, and mentioned this earlier, but what is the institutional culture around expectations of teaching? And in some places, it is still the lecture. Um, so to be able to advocate on behalf of faculty who are breaking that mold in environments where it might not be as encouraged or accepted, and that's an important consideration as well. Because unless you change that culture, you're not going to be able to change the individual practices. So, I think I did pretty well for time. Um, does anybody have any questions? Did I forget anything? Do you have any huge pushbacks in my three-headed hydra monster of digital pedagogy? <laughs> How about it? Yeah, we have. Have a question. Do I just relay it to you? Or? Yeah, can Lee tell us if you can hear and otherwise, or do you want to come up and? Oh, you can come up and talk to me. I can't see you again. The camera's frozen, so it's all right. All she can see is a blackboard, but then she, you know, you can interact. All right. Uh, what do I talking to? Uh, I can hear you. Hi, my name is Peter, and uh, English Department, University of Toronto. Just finished my PhD a few months ago. or defended it. Yay. Thanks so much. This was a, it's been a great conference so far, and I very much enjoyed your talk. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your sense of the future uh, for those large-scale platforms. So you mentioned that you guys are using Google Apps, mm -hmm. um, and that you have some type of partnership. I'm not familiar with that, but you know, here at U of T, uh, let's say we use Blackboard in our department, and I guess across the <coughs> campus. I'm wondering what what, do you, what are your thoughts on the future of platforms? Because I know that uh, signing in and registering for things requires multiple usernames and passwords and whatnot. And do you see a simplified single kind of platform in the future that universities will be using, or will it always remain a kind of fragmented approach, depending on the preferences of individual universities? Um. I think that we're starting to see it more as a unified approach. We've moved, we're moving from Blackboard to Canvas as our learning management system, and Canvas is much more integrated, and so students don't have to log into Canvas and Google Docs. They just have to log into Canvas, and if I give them a link to a Google Doc, it just takes from there. Um, so there is that level of integration, and some of the learning management systems are starting to address that. But the flip side of that is, is then um, some faculty are hesitant to use any tool outside of the uh, learning management system environment, right? So some tools I saw, what was it that um, people were just tweeting out? Storyline? Story map? Story map. So there was, I was watching the Twitter stream and people were, were using story maps. And um, I love those, those tools. And I introduce them to faculty very often. And faculty are resistant because they're like, oh, does it work in Canvas? I said, no, they have to go out. Oh, then I don't want to use it if it's not in the learning management. There's something very comforting about the learning management system in a lot of cases. So I don't see it going away really um, anytime soon. Um, but I do see it in something like Canvas as, as evolving um, towards uh, one login to rule them all. 
uh, which is what Google is trying to do as well. Um, but it's it's uh, it's it's a, it's a changing different thing. As long as there is subscriptions to be paid, um, you know, it's always going to you're always going to have to have that balance. And you'll you'll have faculty who will continue, I think, to use um, all the things on their own. Um, because they find them pedagogically valuable and they just really want to use them. But it's, it's the middle group is, is trying to find that balance between the comfort of the LMS that they're used to and the great tools that are out there that they can be doing really cool things with. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I mean, is that even a good answer? <laughs> but it's a hard question. It's a really yes, good well. question. One that, we're, that we struggle with. He, he liked your answer. <laughs> Is there anybody else who had, would like an opportunity to speak to one of the foremost, um, I don't know, in my universe, of experts? In this oh goodness, you're making me blush. Now I should have put myself on here. <laughs> did you did you see the photo that I tweeted of the classroom? No, so I didn't. I see go back. I go back. I'll go back and do it. Did you tag me on it? In it? Yeah, there's there's two questions. Oh, there you are. There we go. I just the Skype That's a good. That's a good. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's um, it's a question. You know, and, and I've been as I've moved into this new role, as I said, it's one that I've been confronted with, and that um, very often a lot of us don't think about. We think about uh, our classrooms, right? Our classrooms, our spaces, our practices, and that's important. And, and it's you know we value our students and we value student experience and we value their learning and so it's very easy to to just stay in our classrooms and do our best for our students and sometimes again the infrastructure is intimidating we don't change very well or very quickly in higher education um, so we focus on what we can control and that is very often um, as much as we can our classroom spaces but to, to it, it's uncomfortable and it it's different to think about it beyond those spaces and think about that infrastructure, um, think about the systems, think about the culture that is either um, helping or hindering more broad uh, adoption of digital pedagogy techniques. So if I provoke you into silence or stun you into silence, perhaps, <laughs> that's not necessarily um, a, a bad thing, but I hope that the I hope that it makes people think, and that the dialogue can continue long after that, and saying, how do we do long term support for digital pedagogy? Did you, you said you might have had a question if anybody else in the room was from the STEM discipline. Or if everybody here is. Are you from, from the STEM? From the STEM. Yeah. Oh, we have a STEM person. Woohoo! I can't really hear them, so you're gonna they're either gonna have to come up or you're gonna have to repeat the question. Wasn't a motion, <laughs> it's just yeah. Yeah. Show of hands. Um, did you, you had a question? Yeah, you yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, I think, um, Lee, right now you can hear, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so you don't have to lean in or anything. You can just, okay, you can hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm one of the coordinators of the Digital Media Lab at our college, and the model that we do is that we offer to go into the classroom and do workshops for the students to teach them how to do various digital media, whatever the teacher's working with. But I don't quite know how to get the faculty to take over that aspect of it. So they always want us there in the workshop holding their hands, holding their students' hands, coming into our studios, you know, holding their hand the whole time. So I'm not quite sure how to empower them and say, you know, release them and, and do it yourself now kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and that's tricky. Um, you know, we, we offer that, I didn't put that, and thank you for bringing that up. That is something that we offer as well. For the first time they're introducing faculty or introducing a new tool, they'll be like, we can come. Um, I mean, it's, do you do workshops for faculty though? I, I guess would be my question. Do you have a space where faculty can come? One of the biggest fears that faculty have is looking stupid or like they don't know what they're doing uh, in front of their students. Right. We do do um, workshops for faculty. We have a hard time getting faculty to come out to our workshops. They, uh, that's I tweeted out that it's dragging them, kicking and screaming to come to, to the workshops. They're more than happy for us to come into their classroom and do the workshops, but it's hard to get them to come to us first, get them to learn first, and then work on their own. But we do definitely offer them throughout the semester and at, at our PD events at the college too. Yeah, and it might be a question just asking them, why don't you come? 
know, why would you come to our workshop? Uh, in terms of, is it, is it the question of time? Is it a question of format? Is it a question of motivation? Is it a question of fear? Um, you know, these are important considerations to try and design an experience that um, the faculty want to participate in. Um, you know, so it, it's, I find, I mean, and again, it depends on what the tool or technique is. Digital media is one of those very intimidating things. Uh, and in particular academics, we all get stuck in our areas of expertise, right? Like, I'm an expert in this, and you, I mean, if anything, they think they're complimenting you, right? It's like, you are an expert in digital media, and so therefore, I will extend this invitation so you may share your expertise in digital media, whereas I have an expertise in my content. And so there's, there's a lot of those, that siloing going on in people's heads. Um, in that kind of way, so it's, it's breaking down those barriers and those silos too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have an easy answer for that one, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, either, but good luck. <laughs> I actually do have an answer for that because it was oh. something that oh, I good. was um, <laughs> scared Please. of. Um, hi, Leah, it's Paige. Um, it, it was something that I was worried about and particularly worried about because when I started at McMaster, I was cautioned against anything that would not be scalable um, and would lead to the faculty seeing the Digital Scholarship Center as a service center of any sort. And so the strategy that I've been implementing for that, which has been working really well, has been to set, set faculty up, but then have one or more events where faculty are the feature, featured speakers who are talking about what they've done. So it, it actually goes from being, the pedagogical activity goes from being something that they get help with to something that is just part of their scholarly portfolio. It's just something they do. It really helps if you can get someone like an associate dean or a full dean to show up and be there to praise the faculty while they're doing this because that <laughs> does help, that really does help cement it. The next step, and this is something that I'll be implementing this fall, is to offer some digital pedagogy workshops, um, partly at the request of the faculty, but I've set a condition, which is that I will only put these together if they come and present case studies of what they did at it. They said, oh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I could teach, I couldn't teach a whole workshop on my own. I said, that's okay, you don't have to you could talk about what you did and how you did it, right? Um, and they're like, oh yeah, well that wouldn't be so bad. So um, we'll see whether this this goes into phase three where actually, no, it already has. They're already telling, coming and telling me and saying, oh, I'm going to do this. Um, and I say, do you need any help? They're like, well, if I do, I'll come to you. So um, it does help if you can tell them right from the start, you're going to do this. And if they're scared of something, they say, oh, I can't do it on my own. Make them do it on their own. Sit there behind them, give them the instructions, um, and let them type them in. But do not do it for them. Oh. That's very useful. Did you want to, are you able to? I only heard a little bit of it. Oh, uh, basically five. just oh. Um, inviting faculty to present case studies, but in a really structured environment where they can feel sort of empowered and maintain, I guess, a level of comforting expertise well, yes. with still, support. Still yep. having leadership, but not having to be isolated. Very oh. good. So leadership, but no isolation. That's excellent. Actually, yeah, I, I, saw, I saw Paige tweeting out earlier about how a lot of her work, or I was going through Twitter for that, um, saying how a lot of her work is, um, you know, helping develop networks with faculty and within faculty. Uh, you know, getting, you know, it's, a lot of the times they do feel very isolated, and so helping them feel less alone. Um, that's when we get into the teddy bear image <laughs> as opposed to the wire image. But certainly that teddy bear image is just as, is just as important. We have another question. This one is from Jeffrey Rockwell. I was going to begin by saying I think, I think there's a lot of great advice there about how to get faculty involved. There, there's nothing like helping them put something on their CV. I, <laughs> oh, I think, yeah. You know, annual reports. Uh, uh, now, my question is going to be a different one. At the University of Alberta, we've started to invest a lot in, in really heavy um, 
very expensive digital pedagogy. Uh, we've been spending about a million per MOOC. We're spending, uh, we have, a, we have, we're spending uh, about a hundred thousand, depends on how you calculate it, for hybrid courses. So there's a big pot of money, there's competitions. The moment this, mo this amount of money is involved is, uh, it creates all sorts of anxieties about intellectual property. And uh, so, and I've, I've been one of the people trying to broker an intellectual property agreement that is respectful of all sides. Uh, and I've been trying to go at it with a, a sort of non-exclusive. Everybody gets to, you know, if a prof, uh, especially the contingent, you know, sessionals, if they work on something and they go somewhere else, they can take their IP, the university can keep it and run the course again. But I was wondering if you knew of some good examples of agreements that were, on the one hand, gave the university or the department the ability to keep on offering a course that they've invested in, on the other hand, allows faculty to some sense of uh, ownership, control, or the ability to take it to another uh, university or something? Uh, no. <laughs> and, and we're struggling with the exact same thing here, and we don't even have uh, an advocate like you here at the University of Kentucky. We have the same sort of initiative. We're spending money on MOOCs. We've got this Eli initiative, e-learning innovation initiative, where we're trying to create more online and hybrid courses. Um, and uh, it's a question that's consistently come up, particularly because we're paying for it through this, these grants. Um, who owns it? Um, and while we don't, well, we don't have uh, as many adjuncts. We do use non-tenure line instructors for a lot of these things, where a faculty or a chair will get the grant, and then it's instructors who are doing the work developing it. And the the chairs are are, are on the one hand saying this is a way that I can pay my instructors more money because I can I can supplement their salary. But that question of who owns it once it's done, um, it's really interesting that our faculty senate doesn't really want to answer that question um, and or isn't, isn't interested in, in pushing the matter and in, in answering that question. And it's one that has, um, in a lot of cases, not been very well answered across the United States um, in terms of, in terms of uh, what they're doing. You know, and, and how do they deal with it? I got into a debate around this too. Is, is this like a patent or is this like a syllabi? Or is it like a textbook? What, what is this? And, and conceptually, that's how we're still thinking of it. We're not thinking of it in the ways that they currently exist. We're trying to impose old models on new ways of, ways of thinking and, and disseminating. Thank you so much, Lee. I think we've come to our time, but it was wonderful hearing what you had to say, and we really enjoyed the platform that you selected as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, go play.